This is one of the happier moments uh, for me and my dad. We are enjoying some time together, uh, which we never did when I was a child. Not that I can remember. Certainly nothing, anything that I remember. In fact, if I was to think of my dad in one word, it would be the word absent. He just wasn't there. In fact, today, this 91-year-old man now, he was 85 in this picture, has never told me that he loves me. And I am a person that uh, one of his love languages is words of affirmation. Uh, Words matter. And to have a dad that has never communicated, hey, I love you, uh, that matters to me. That matters to me. So I have to work through those things. Uh, It's not necessarily easy. In fact, for some of you, uh, there is a lot more painful things, perhaps. Some of you have had wonderful relationships with your father. And if you were to describe him in one word, it would be a wonderful word. But in order to kind of just prepare ourselves for this next 45 minutes or so of a presentation on knowing God, I'd like to know a little bit about the relationship with your father. I'd like for you to spend the next five to ten minutes at your table to be willing just to say in one word, here's what describes my dad, my relationship with my dad, and then maybe one sentence on why. One word, maybe a sentence or two. But feel free to just share at your tables uh, for the next five to ten minutes, and let's uh, get to know a little bit more about the relationships with their father there at the table. So enjoy your conversation. We're focused here on this retreat primarily, as well as our foundation class on preparation period. Those first 30 years of Jesus quietly preparing. I think we've done a decent job so far of convincing you that preparation matters and that it certainly mattered to Jesus. And as he thought about how he would model doing leadership, he would not just come down on Friday and die and then just kind of hang around in the grave on Saturday and do the resurrection thing on Sunday and just kind of basically do a weekend retreat and I'm done with the modeling of leadership. He doesn't even come in and kind of, listen, let me show you how you can advance so quick. I'm going to do this in just a couple of weeks or I'm going to do this in three months. One or two quarters, I'm done and, you know, I hope you get it. No, he came, he lived for 30 years, of which most likely he spent the majority of his life in a carpentry shop, which really, when you get down to it, it's really a construction business that was going on at the time. And in fact, almost nearly, there was a temple being built that was even larger than the one in Rome, being built just seven miles away from his house. And most likely, it was one of the biggest government projects around anyone that had any skills in construction was probably really working hard on this big government project. Most likely, Jesus was thoroughly involved in the construction business, and there's no mention of Jesus' earthly father, talking about being absent, uh, no mention of him, really, after age 13. So I don't know when he passed away, but he's certainly not on the scene when Jesus goes into his ministry at age 30. So somewhere along there, he passed away. Being the firstborn son, he most likely took over the P&L of the business. And so we are well aware that Jesus came to model how to do leadership, how to, in fact, he understands what it means to run and be involved in a business. But all during this preparation, he is placing great value on preparation He's getting extremely clear on calling. And the one other thing that he's doing really well is modeling it what it means to get to know the Heavenly Father. This is so critical, particularly when we think about those three callings that we were just referring to previously, is that middle primary calling. And that is, come follow me, the sense of really getting close to the heart of God, listening to his whispers, knowing what they are. You don't really know someone unless you become very intimate with them and be able to know their heartbeat on things, to be able to 
just in the way, the nuances in which they say things and do things, you say, I, I, I know what they mean. I know what they're saying. In fact, sometimes you get so close to someone that you just can anticipate what their heart is on this matter. And Jesus is modeling this so many times during those first number of months with the, his business leaders as he's calling, come follow me. He's just simply, simply modeling what it means to get to know the Heavenly Father. There's no big success stories going on during this period early on. Certainly not during the preparation period. There's just no big splashy news. And in fact, there is nothing written about Jesus up until year 30. He is placing great value in getting to know the Father. And so, I trust that even though we have heard messages like this in the past regarding getting to know God, I trust that these, this little focus that we can place on it for life work leadership for you would be just an amazing opportunity for you to see this in the context of it's not just good for your personal life, it's really good for business. For you to know the Father's heartbeat, do you know His voice, to be able to make decisions and to be able to re react and respond on the moment because you have so much confidence that you understand the Father's heart. You understand what He would want you to do in this situation. I mean, it just gives you a huge advantage. And the opposite is true. If you're not connected with the Father, if there's something going on, you're just, there's a distance between you and God. Hey, you just lack confidence. You fake it well because you have to fake it sometimes. But that's all you're doing is that you're faking it. And you know it. But oh, the confidence that comes when you really know the Father. Oh, it is just priceless. It's so valuable for your business. So, let us look at what Jesus is doing over these 30 years and how he leads his disciples to get to know the Father. Now, I'll be honest with you. You can turn the page now as we take a look at these two pages on insights on knowing God. And you can just take some notes there along the way. I can tell you at the outset that um, I, I've heard a number of business leaders in the past say, you know what, frankly, um, uh, getting to know God, the, the reason why it's a, it's a tough proposition for me, frankly, I just don't have time. If I was Jesus and was able to just take walks with my disciples and just kind of go here and there and just not have to worry about things, uh, you know, you know, he was just he was he had a lifestyle that was just chilled. But I tried to bring you back to what's going on in those first 30 years. I seriously doubt that, that there was a whole lot of just chilling going on if you're having to run your father's business. And he's also on the side spending a lot of time getting to know the Word of God. He's not doing this as his main job. He's running his father's business. And he's also on the side really getting to know the Scripture really, really well. So that by the age of 30, he is able to be called a master teacher or a rabbi. So his life is full. But we really get a glimpse of Jesus' life in Mark. Now... <laughs> Mark is really fascinating to me. Mark is unlike the other books in the Bible. See, the other books in the Bible, particularly the Gospels, you get a story about Jesus, and it happened over here in Jerusalem. And then the very next verse or two is over here in Galilee, and, over, and there's no sense of, you know, there's probably weeks, months that have flown by here and there. But what if I was to show you a 124-hour period in the life of Jesus? where from morning to night to the next morning, he's going nuts. What if I was to show you how he balanced his life? What he did to really be in tune with what's going on around him? What if I could show you this? Well, I can't go to John, the book of John. John just doesn't give one rip about time. Matthew, oh my God. Goodness, chapter after chapter after chapter is about all these parables and goes on and on. It's all about his teaching. It, it, mind you, it's great. Luke 
Well, he's really kind of interested in, in a lot of particular details that, frankly, men and women who are really, you know, let's get to, get to the root of things, you know? Luke doesn't like to do that. He's a doctor, and he wants to explain every little thing on, on details. And, and particularly since Mary influenced his writings, you get a lot of Mary's perspective, and it's a great book to read if you want a woman's perspective on the Gospels. The book of Luke is great, but the book of Mark. Oh, most likely, who's his cousin? It's Peter. Most scholars believe that Peter greatly influenced the writing of the book of Mark. But the amazing thing about the book of Mark is that it only has four parables in the entire book, but it's got 18 miracles. Oh my goodness, is this guy like flash. Boom! 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 Oh, love success. Give me those miracles, you know? The, those, those teaching, those parables, forget them. Let's get on with the action, right? Well, 150 times Mark uses the historical present tense. What does that mean? That means that what, that's what news people do when you're telling a story. He tries to bring you from what has happened in history and bring you into the present so that you can just feel it. It's, he wants as much action. He wants you. It's intense. 150 times he uses the historical present tense. Like he, he doesn't want to talk about the future. He doesn't want to talk about He wants to get you right into the present. And he loves that. 41 different times in this small book, Mark uses the word immediately. And immediately. Remember, I used that phrase when, he, when Jesus got out of, the, out of his baptism, and the Bible says immediately he went into the wilderness. That's just one of the 41 times in the book of Mark. So he loves, he loves. Boom, 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 boom. If you are a leader in today's culture, you're probably saying, give me some Mark. I want to get to know Jesus. Give me some Mark. So since you want it, I'm going to give it to you for the next, oh, 20, 25 minutes or so. Are you ready? I want to go to Mark chapter 1. If you have your Bible app, turn to it. If you don't, that's fine. I'm going to read enough of the story along the way. But let me just turn the page and let me share with you some insights on the Jesus journey. The first thing that I want you to see that Jesus is doing that we've already talked about, but let me underscore, is that he's staying extremely alert to what the Father is doing. There's numerous places in Scripture where he says, I can only do what the Father tells me to do. And I only do what I see the Father doing. One of the best things you can do to get to know the Father is just to shut up and to watch him. Watch what he's doing in somebody that you really respect spiritually. If you respect some guy, gal who's running a business and say, I'm just going to, I'm just going to get up close to that person. I'm going to watch him for the next quarter. I'm just going to really stay alert to the ways in which the father is working through them. But then when you start waking up every morning and you just say a simple prayer like, God, I know that you're always at work. I just don't see you a lot. Help me today to just stay alert. And so I'm driving in my car to work. I'm staying alert. I'm walking past my colleagues. I'm just staying alert. I'm just watching and listening and staying alert to what is the Father doing today? What is he doing? If you would just do that, like put your radar on a whole new level to say, I believe he's always at work, so let me stay alert to his activity around me. And when I see it, I'm just going to recognize it and join him in what he's doing. I might now be able to see someone at work that has been saying something a certain way, and it's just gone past you, and all of a sudden you have eyes to see that. Wow. And someone's been telling you about this trend in the business for a while, and you really hadn't heard it. And all of a sudden, because you're staying alert, whoa, all of a sudden you have ears to hear something 
that you hadn't quite heard before. I mean, this is just an amazing thing if you now just start saying, I'm going to stay alert to what the Father is doing around me and simply join Him in what He is doing around me. It's fascinating. Well, this story is found in Mark chapter 1, verse 21 through 38. And it starts off with him doing something that he's really good at. And it says, he went to Capernaum, and went, and when on the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The first thing that I want you to notice is corporate worship. One of the ways in which Jesus got to know the Father and got the edge on getting to know him was he just said, I'm going to prioritize corporate worship. Now, if there's a guy <laughs> that could skim on worship, it would be Jesus, right? I mean, the guy doesn't really need to go to church, does he? But he takes his business guys, and anytime they, whether or not they're in Capernaum, which is really a resort area, kind of like Cape Town, you know, I go to, whether I go to Cape Town or not, if I'm home back in Nazareth, I'm just showing up to corporate worship. That's what I do. I set patterns in my life so that me, my followers, my kids, we do certain patterns. And one of the patterns is we do church. And we don't skim on it. We actually, and the reason why I, I got all sorts of apps that I can listen and praise God and worship Him, but there's something powerful about corporate worship. And if you're not experiencing it, you better find it. Because this fills up a tank that's emptied during the week. You need to get your tank filled up. And corporate worship often does that. And notice that he just doesn't go to the synagogue, but he actually uses his gifts. We've got different people and leaders that I know that will use their gifts because they have gifts of compassion. They'll spend time in children's ministry. Some other people teach. Some other people do all sorts of different things. But it's to find out what is your spiritual gift and use it within the corporate church setting. This is just something that you can easily dismiss. And say, ah. No, if there's someone that could easily dismiss corporate worship, it's Jesus. He doesn't. Every time you see him going into any city, he's looking for a place to corporately worship. I just want to encourage you, set that pattern. That may be one of the reasons why there may be a little bit of a distance between you and the, and the Lord. If you want to get to know God and get an edge in your leadership, develop your patterns of corporate teaching. Then, what's really fascinating is that the people say, they were amazed at his teaching, and they said, what authority does he have? This is just unbelievable. And he journaled, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this later. But the reason for the, this guy had authority is the words that I just wrote here. And that is, he learned and applied things. Here's what I'm saying, is that the word authority means to learn something and to apply it. You know why your children push you on certain things and question your authority? Often, not always, but often, you say something, but don't apply it. The word for authority means to learn and to apply. It's at that point that you have authority. So when you're talking about values in your company, and there's something called integrity that might be in your company, and you don't really apply it, you lose authority. If you have a value in your company called compassion and you do not apply it to your life, you lose authority. For Jesus, he is learning something from the Father on a regular basis and he seeks to apply it. Journaling helps you capture these things. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. Now, what's fascinating about this is that he ends up teaching and, and, a, and, a, and an evil spirit jumps up and goes crazy. Now, I would ask you that, believe me, I'm, I'm going to be over in about 10 to 15 minutes here. 
please don't anyone get up and just scream. If you've got to go to the restroom, that's fine. But don't get up and act like a maniac act. Because I can tell you one thing. I've been in the room twice in my life with a demon-possessed person. And it is absolutely draining to try to settle that person down and to really deal with demonic things is just absolutely exhausting. And I can tell you, verse 10, and most of you know because you have to do presentations, whenever you have to make a major presentation, talk to people, like teach, the hours that you have to put in in preparation and then deliver it, you're exhausted. You're just exhausted. So, by now, Jesus is coming out. It's past noontime. He's actually been teaching, and he's actually dealt with a demonic guy. After that type of day, you know what I like to do on Sunday? We have in, the, in America NFL football on, in the weekends, and I just can't wait to get to my couch and just lay down and turn on the, the TV and to watch my favorite sport. But Jesus doesn't do this. This is a 24-hour period where he's just going nuts. He actually gets invited over to Simon Peter's mother-in-law's house. Now, it's bad enough on a Sunday, and you've had a full day already, and it's just noontime, to be invited over to your own mother-in-law's house, but over to your friend's mother-in-law's house? (sighs) And I can tell you, when I walk in the door, I'm just looking to get out the door. As soon as possible, I'll be honest with you. I mean, it's just not one of my favorite things to do when I'm exhausted is to go and visit someone at their house. You walk into the house, and you realize that the lady of the house actually has a fever. That's the word. And you know what I'm doing? I'm feeling, I'll be honest with you, I'm feeling great about it. That's the excuse to leave. You know, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm I'm, I'm sorry. You know, and we'll we'll come back and visit some other time. But you know what he does? He extends grace to this lady and to others. And you know what happens? He actually moves towards someone when he's exhausted and shows compassion to this lady. And you know what he gets for his reward? The Bible says further on in this passage that now when they hear that he moved toward this lady and healed her, the Bible says the entire town came to the neighborhood. He's got a problem. Now everyone wants a piece of him. It's in the afternoon. It's like later on in the day for you. You know when you've been in the office or you've had a, a totally exhausting day, and now it's 3, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, and everyone wants a piece of you. And you're trying to get out the door. But can you imagine the entire town wanting a piece of you? And he, the Bible says he heals many, not all. He heals many of them. And it goes into the night, the Bible says. It went dark. And then, this amazing thing happens. It says this, and let me say before I read this, that after this type of day, when I've gone, burnt my candle on both ends, if there's ever a time when I'm going to skim on my relationship with the Father, it's going to be tomorrow morning. I'm going to get as much sleep and justify it. You know, my body needs rest and all these kind of things. Da, 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 da. This is what Jesus does. Verse 35 says this. Very early in the morning, while it is still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place to pray. You know what I think he's thinking? He's thinking this. I'm exhausted. Tomorrow, I got some momentum going at work. And I know everyone's going to want a piece of me. And you know what? If I'm exhausted, and I make some decisions when I'm exhausted, it's going to be a problem. 
Whether or not I get an extra hour of sleep or not, I don't know what's going to help. But I can tell you one thing. I better know the Father's heart on things because I need an edge tomorrow if I'm exhausted. And I think that Jesus prioritizes getting to know the Father so much that he's convinced that I got to get, even when I'm exhausted, I got to get a little bit of time with him. Why? Because when I make decisions and when I lead, when I'm tired, that's a problem. And one extra hour of sleep is not going to fix your problem. But maybe an extra one little hour or 30 minutes with the Father could. And so, this is amazing. You guys know this story, right? <laughs> what happens is that because this is one of the very first times that anything exciting has happened in Jesus' life, he was a pretty, early on in his ministry, there wasn't a whole lot going on. And this is one of the first times a lot of things is going on. It's like being a part of business, and all of a sudden, some profit, some results are happening. And the Bible says that Peter looked for him and exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. I mean, Peter woke up and everyone is coming to the, to the house. And where is the guy? Where's the boss? He's coming in late. What's the problem? And Peter goes and finds him. says, everyone's looking for you. It's like, Boss, this is great. This is the first time that the business is really starting to go well. I mean, let's go back. And this is what he says, Jesus says. Jesus in verse 38 says, replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that what I can preach there also. Get the calling now. This is why. I have come. Go back with me now. He did two things yesterday. He did his primary calling, and that was to preach and teach. He did some secondary things, which were good. He did some healing. He goes and checks in with the Father, and guess what? His entire corporate team is saying, oh man, the momentum is going with the healing thing. Come on, let's go back to where we were so we can do more healing. And he got alone with the Father, and I got this deep sense that the Father whispers to him and says, Psst, if you go back to that same village, they want a piece of your healing, not your teaching." Remember why I primarily called you? It was to do the preaching. Don't get lost in the healing. Move to a nearby city so that we can teach. This is why I have come. His ability, write this down. The spiritual disciplines were so important, just abiding. And what he does is this. Jesus is able to say no to the good things in order to be able to say yes to the best things. This is what makes great leaders. Your ability to tell your entire team who's saying, come on, everyone's looking, let's go do some healing. And your ability to look the team straight in the face and say, no, let's go in this direction this is why we exist as a company. Your ability to look at the team and say no to very good things. It's easy to say no to bad things, but it's almost so difficult to say no to good things in order to say yes to the best things. And Jesus is able to do this after a hectic 24-hour period, and he prioritizes getting to know the Father. It gives him that edge that most of us desire to have. So, do you think getting to know the Father is critical to Jesus modeling leadership? Absolutely. It's just not good for personal development. It's great for business. And I encourage you to prioritize to get to know the Father better. 
Spend some time in the book of Mark. Enjoy it. Spend some time getting to know him. Let's bow for a word of prayer.